Hello, it's Scott Manley here. After months of searching, the crew on the International Space Station have finally located an elusive air leak in the Zvezda service module. And supposedly, the crew's technique for locating this tiny crack involved the innovative use of tea leaves, releasing them into the air and watching where they eventually collected. Now, they did have things like ultrasonic leap detectors and other high-tech hardware on board, but sometimes you just have to hack together towards a solution, or as some people say, MacGyver the heck out of things. And spaceflight is full of stories like this. Hey, The Martian is a great movie, a great book, where the entire story is pretty much, uh, you know, Mark Watney hacking together solutions for problems using the things that aren't well suited to the task. And lots of disco music as well. But anyway, I thought this would be a great time to list some of my favourite space hacks from space history. Starting out with a rare example of a literal life hack. Uh, YouTube is full of dumb life hacks, but to be honest, they are, they're mostly useless. But on Apollo 13, the astronauts had to figure out how to put a square peg into a round hole when the lunar module carbon dioxide scrubbers needed to be replaced and the square lithium hydroxide canisters from the command module were incompatible, owing them to be the wrong shape, right? So, yet, yeah, in flight, they had to build an adapter using only the stuff that they had on board the spacecraft, which was obviously stripped down for its journey to the moon. They have a plastic bag, a piece of stiff cardboard, a lot of grey tape, which we sometimes call duct tape, and a spacesuit ventilation hose. And they would... they built this together and I have a video where I actually replicated this. Uh, the hose went into the suit uh, air system and that would then continue to suck air through the system and keep the astronauts alive for their return to Earth. <laughs> so yeah, that was a rare literal life hack, but it's a perfect example of how you might MacGyver something together to make uh, the mission work. I mean, Apollo 13 is full of many other hacks and improvised solution that they had to you know, come up with to basically deal with the problems on hand. Uh, you, you know, it's basically you can't get spare parts or tools shipped up. You have to make do with what you have. Now, as it turns out, the Apollo missions are full of critical hacks that save the day or the mission and sometimes the crew. Apollo 11 had a moment where the crew discovered a circuit breaker cap on the floor of the lunar module after they did their surface EVA. Buzz thinks that he probably hit it with the backpack of his EVA suit and he broke off the circuit breaker, which had been popped out after landing. Now, that might not sound bad. I mean, there was a lot of circuit breakers, but this one in particular was very much a circuit they needed to unbreak. This one controlled power to the ascent engine, which was needed for leaving the moon and getting back into orbit. So without being able to close that breaker, they would have had a hard time lighting the engine and returning. But after a bit of thinking, Buzz Aldrin figured out how to close the breaker using a pen. Uh, to be clear, this wasn't the famous Fisher Space Pen because those have metal cases and jamming bits of metal into electrical panels is not a good idea. It was a more mundane plastic felt pen which saved the day. And I actually remember seeing this was on display along with the broken circuit breaker uh, at the Museum of Flight. So uh, Apollo 17 is another great example. The lunar rover, uh, it required an improvised repair. Gene Cernan managed to drop a hammer on one of the fenders, which were essential to stop lunar dust getting kicked up by the wheels. So when the, they, while they're still on EVA, they attempt to tape the broken part back on using their duct tape. And that sort of worked, but it fell off quickly because the moon dust essentially ruined the tape's adhesion. Uh, by the end of the first day's EVA, they were completely covered in moon dust. So while the crew slept on the surface of the moon, engineers and astronauts back on Earth tried to come up with a better solution. So their version of the repair they took four of the lunar maps which were on cardboard and they taped them together using the tape on the lunar module where there was less dust to ruin the adhesion. And then when they went out to the rover, they fixed it onto the rover using clamps that were borrowed from the optical alignment telescope. 
So this solution lasted for the rest of the surface stay. And in the end, actually, they, they needed the clamps back, and so they took the maps back with them. And those also are on display in the National Air and Space Museum, still taped together nearly five decades later. Uh, not all the Apollo hacks were physical. Um, of course, I love to talk about Apollo 14, which had a, a broken abort switch, which would make it impossible for them to land on the moon. But computer programmer Don Ailes, who was in Mission Control, came up with a solution which involved editing the computer memory of the Apollo Guidance computer. Uh, they basically convinced the computer that it was already in an abort mode and stopping it from triggering another abort mode. Meanwhile, the computer was actually landing on the moon. And, and I like to think of this as the world's greatest tech support call. So as Apollo wound down, the last flight of Saturn V would launch the Skylab into orbit. And that didn't go according to plan. About a minute into the flight, as the vehicle started to go supersonic, the shockwave tore off a section of the meteoroid shielding and later during stage separation a retro rocket blasted upwards and it tore off one of the solar panels. The other solar panel was found to be uh, held in place because it was tangled in debris from the meteoroid shielding. The meteoroid shielding was also part of the thermal control system so temperatures inside the station quickly rose to uninhabitable levels and without all the solar panels the station didn't have enough power to operate uh, at full power. So the crew of Skylab 2 were expected to launch the next day but they gave them like an extra 10 days to figure out how to fix all these problems and so everyone back is trying to work on solutions to this. You've got the backup crew figuring out EVAs and trying to design system, design stuff. In the end, in that short amount of time, they built a space parasol, which they would extend through one of the experimental airlocks and pop open and then pull against the side of the station. And that got the thermal situation under control. The solar panel that was locked in place, well, they performed a fascinating uh, unorthodox EVA where the Apollo spacecraft moved into within a few meters of the station while astronaut Paul Weitz leaned out of the hatch using a 10 foot long pole with a hook on the end to try and pull the debris clear of the spring loaded panel. You know, like someone on a boat, it was literally a boat hook they were using. Uh, Pete Conrad, of course, had to manually fly the Apollo to stop them colliding. Uh, every time they pulled, the spacecraft would get pulled together. Ultimately, this didn't work because the strap had rivets that had embedded themselves in the structure. So instead, the panels were freed by cutting the strap and they put the cutters on the end of a 25-foot pole and they uh, operated them remotely. Initially, this didn't seem to be working. So Pete Conrad, after trying to cut them, he made his way up the pole and at that moment, the uh, strap snapped and the pole w pulled away from the station, knocking Pete off into space. But of course, fortunately, he was tethered to the station. But that was a hairy moment. So there was a whole lot more uh, in the story of Skylab. Uh, the whole rescue and repair is full of procedures like this. And equally, I've got to say, on the Soviet side, Salyut 7 had a lot of improvisations and MacGyvering. It was... A, a pretty dramatic rescue, not quite as dramatic as the recent movie, by the way. Anyway, uh, the shuttle era, they had a few moments. In uh, 1998, the, there was a case where they had a smoke alarm that was going off all the time, and they patched that up with grey tape. Um, but my favourite one is on STS-51D in 1985. They were performing a satellite launch. And the satellite went wrong. After it launched, there was a release. The release mechanism was supposed to flip a physical lever on the satellite that would arm it. And they had to figure out how to fix it. Now, one plan was to put the astronaut or an astronaut out on the end of the arm and have him sort of reach up and flip the switch. But they thought this was going to be too dangerous because the satellite was spinning. Instead, they built a tool in the cabin using stuff they had on hand. They, they called this the fly swatter. And they built it out of like window shades, grey tape, and then they had to perform an EVA to put this on the end of the robot arm. And there was no EVA scheduled, so they had to totally improvise how to do this. So they did this and then re-rendezvoused with the spacecraft, flipped the switch with the new tools, and it still didn't work. So in the end, they left the spacecraft in space and came back on the next mission, or a later mission, 
and they had to install like a bypass box on the lockout system so that they could send the spacecraft to geostationary orbit and I believe it's still there well of course it's still there today I'm not sure whether it's still operational today but it certainly operated for a fair amount of time Moving on to the space station era, you would imagine that having regular deliveries from the Earth would mean that you no longer have the need to MacGyver tools. Hey, they have a 3D printer there, you think that would solve all their problems, but no, they are still hacking together things on board to solve problems they didn't anticipate. While the station was under construction, one of the solar panel pairs were launched early on and mounted on top of the station in a temporary location. After the truss was finished, the, those panels were then restored and the unit was relocated to the end of the truss where they would be redeployed. But as the panels were extending out, something snagged and the panels tore. So they stopped the deployment and they had to figure out how to fix this. What they came up with was a set of giant cufflinks and these were fabricated from wires and other materials they had on board. So the panels are right out at the furthest point on the station. And to reach this location, they actually had to extend the station's manipulator arm using a tool that was carried by the space shuttle to inspect the heat shield because the robot arm on the shuttle had to be able to reach under and see the heat shield so it had an extension. So the astronaut rode the end of this thing out to the site and then carefully threaded their cufflinks through the panel, adding extra support where it was tearing. And I say this carefully because, of course, there's a lot of electrical power flowing through these uh, panels and the panels themselves are very delicate and either damaging the panels or the astronaut would be a very bad outcome. Afterwards the pa panels were extended and they still operate today with the emergency fix still in place. Uh, another improvised fix uh, for the ISS uh, solar power system was uh, Sunita Williams and Akiko Hoshide they were replacing a main bus switching unit and they found themselves unable to bolt the thing back together um, with the tools they had on hand due to the bolts being stuck. So they analysed the problem, they figured out there was debris and metal shavings getting stuck in there. So they developed some tools again on orbit. They took a jumper cable they had and uh, cut it, splayed out the wires and made themselves a wire brush. They modified a toothbrush for EVA use, which means, you know, <laughs> extra big handles and lanyards and hoops to hang it on with. And so yeah, with those custom tools in hand, they went out, performed another EVA, and they completed the installation, returning the $200 billion station to full power with the help of a $2 toothbrush. The more you look at problem solving in space, the more you, that you discover stories and moments like this, where you're far from home and you have to work with what you have on hand, but at least the crew are backed up by teams of experts on the ground who can help check that your crazy plan will actually work. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.